Good afternoon. Welcome to Curious Coaches Club. Um, same place, same time. Feels like, what, 20 weeks in? Um, uh, almost is 20 weeks in, so we've been going quite a while now. And uh, hopefully those of you that are here are fairly familiar with the format and the flow of the program, uh, what we're all about. Um, I'm taking a bit of a, a back seat today. And uh, whilst she just jumps on here as well, I'm going to hand the baton over to Marianne, who's going to guide us through. And I'm going to jump across and sit next to Gemma today and talk about coaching and kids. So, so that should be fun, really, for me. Um, but I'm going to pass back over to Marianne, and then she can do the, um, the official opening, etc. So over to you. Marianne, are you there? Well, maybe she's not. <laughs> Scared her off. Right, are you there, Marianne? Yes or no? Okay, right, she's she's having some wonderful technical difficulties. Okay, so the plan today is um, pretty much as Thank normal from a, from a curious coach's perspective. I'm not sure about taking oh, a back seat. I think you're in a hot seat this Ah, well, maybe so, but look, over to you. I'm going to say nothing else now for the moment. Over to you. Hello? Yeah, we've got you. I am, yeah. We certainly can. Can you? And uh, also, I'm not sure about being taking the back seat today. We, we hope... You put in the hot seat so that we can get some information from both him and Gemma about the subject of coaching nine millennials. So um, I'd like to say, uh, I'm sorry, do um, just pop your name and maybe the sport that you coach in the chat box for us, and also use that to pop in any questions that you would like to ask us as we go through this session today. Uh, so I think it'd be really nice to start by um, allowing our guests to introduce themselves and to just let us know a little bit about their background in coaching nine to 11 year old children. So um, we start with you, Gemma. Yes, of course. Hello, everyone. So um, I've been teaching gymnastics for about, I think, like 26 years. I think I started when I was 15. Um, and I have I made a career as a full time gymnastics coach for uh, over 10 years. Um, I now work for British Gymnastics within their education department um, as a resource officer and I work part-time still as a gymnastics coach. I love the sport, um, I, I can't get away from it, so although um, I'm lucky enough to work full-time for the governing body, I still really enjoy coaching, so I do that um, on the outside as well. Great, thank you very much Gemma. Um, and Nick, could you you introduce yourself as well um, to us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Afternoon. Uh, so Nick Lever, I'm head of coaching at UK Coaching. Um, but from a from a coaching perspective, um, probably similar to, to Gemma really. I've always coached, and I spent uh, quite a long time working in a, a Premier League academy, working with nines, tens, and elevens. So this was very much kind of the age group that I that I worked with for, for a long period of time. A lot of those boys have now gone through and are playing Premier League football. Uh, so ones that have gone on to, uh, to achieve the top uh, of the game and others that have gone on to achieve the top in other things, like kids that have gone on to be Wimbledon ball boys and one that's now doing very well as a grime artist. Don't ask me what a grime artist is, but some music thing that the youth are into, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, I used to manage one of the national coaching programmes at the FA for five to 11s, uh, had 94 full-time coaches working in the program that I used to lead. So yeah, that kind of age group was, uh, was a real focus of a lot of my own coaching as well. So it's, it's nice to be in the, uh, in the opposite seat today to talk about some of this stuff. Brilliant. Thank you very much to both of you. And I'm really looking forward to, uh, to, to asking you questions and picking your brains and hopefully learning some great stuff and exploring this subject with you today. So if we dive right into the topic, um, I'd like to ask each of you from your experience what you think the key characteristics are of this age group that we need to really consider when we're coaching them. 
So um, can I come to you first, Nick? Yeah, sure. So rather than kind of give you a give you a list of you know characteristics of nine to eleven year olds, you know if you've worked with them or you currently do, you know, you know you'll be familiar with them as people generally. But I wanted to kind of think about some of the things that I experienced from working with um, with this kind of thing, these kind of kids for a long time. So what I found was um, they were they were very honest. Uh, if you created the environment, they would tell you what they thought. Um, and they would start to have some real clarity on what they were thinking about as well. Uh, and often very insightful. So I probably learned as much on my coaching as I did from going on a coaching course as I did with working with the kids. Um, they're starting to be a bit more socially aware, definitely as you kind of move to that older age group part. Um, much more intrinsically motivated by nature. Uh, but again, that starts to shift. Um, a lot of the kids are quite streetwise by that stage. You know, I, I used to work with kids that would travel all the way across London, underground to uh, walk from stations on their own. They were looking after little sister while mum worked late shifts in pubs. And, and I think generally they were smarter than they were given credit for. Um, and and I think if we if we understand that, then I think it probably impacts on our coaching. That was certainly my experiences of working with some of the kids that I did. Great, thank you, Nick. You've, um, you've just reminded me that my my son used to get a train to go skating at that age with his mates. They all disappear away from the mountains to go and skate in the towns, and I used to find that really interesting. But yeah, certainly becoming much much more um, autonomous and independent at that mm. age. Um, so, Gemma, if I come to you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think um, for us, because obviously gymnastics is a is quite a uh, like an early specialist. So some of them by the age of sort of nine to eleven, they may well have already been doing gymnastics for sort of six, you know, four to six years. So at this point, um, between nine and eleven, they're actually just at, um, starting to compete, which is a really key um, key thing for them. Um, and also, they they do know, like like you say, like. Um, Nick said they're much more intrinsically sort of driven. They know what they can and can't do. They know what motivates them, um, and so that's that's good. So it, it really is um, important that you sort of know the individual, and when, when I'm coaching them, sort of know what motivates them um, and how to how to sort of um, keep them going, keep them motivated, especially when they sort of turn to you know find some things at this stage quite difficult as they're really changing. Um, so the key, I think, one of the key things of this age group is providing lots of variety, um, variety for them to continue to achieve and sort of find these small successes and lots of things that they do. Thanks. Um, I, I I've jotted down the that the bit about their bodies changing, and we'll come yeah. to that next. Actually, because I think that's quite a key bit of this age, isn't it? To think that that it's not just the emotional and social bits, but there's also stuff going on for them physiologically and, and maturationally across all of those different um, those different stages. But if we stick yeah. a little bit with the stuff that you both talked about in terms of becoming more intrinsic and more socially aware, do you do you think there's a big difference, or are there any differences between the sort of individual sports and particularly maybe gymnastics that's quite an early specialization sport and maybe the team sports as well yeah i, mean, yeah. I don't know about nick with the um if you obviously have more of the team thing but especially with gymnastics as an individual like for artistic say which is where i'm from women's artistic it's um it's an individual sport and so there's there's nowhere to hide you can't sort of um, you can't hide behind anyone. You can't be a specialist in just one thing and be really good at, um, you know, maybe just one element. You have to be good at all four pieces uh, for women's artistic. And so you you do have to. It's quite it's harsh. You, you know, you 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 do have that sort of. Um, and I think at that point they know their strengths and weaknesses, and so they do compare quite a lot with maybe the other the other members in their group uh, the group with them. And that's a real key thing because. Although they may well be really good on floor or vault or tumble because they're really powerful, all they actually see is somebody else in their group is really flexible and why can't they be like that? They don't see that that person also looks at them and is like, oh gosh, I wish they're so flexible or they're so powerful, they can tumble really well. I wish I could do that. 
um, and don't see their own their own strength. So I do think that social aspect um, at this point is quite is quite key being an individual sport because, like I say, if there's if if there's something that they can't do or they struggle with, there is there is sort of nowhere to hide behind it. They just they just have to work really hard or do the physical preparation and the flexibility training to be able to you know to get that skill that they really want to be able to do or that their friends are doing and they want to do which is another key thing thanks before i come to nick i'm curious about how in that environment that you would support them sort of supporting each other so like you say it's individuals isn't it so they're not they're not parts of a team that kind of are able to be different and work yeah. together how would you approach yeah. that yeah, I, to be honest, I try not to. So when I when I say we're part of a team, so although like when they go to competitions, they are competing for themselves. Actually, we're all part of the same club, and so that that is that team element of that. So although so and so, you know, one of the kids may be really good at that, we try and I try and really um, focus that we celebrate everyone's successes, and we that you know they they notice that somebody else is good at something, and and they're pleased for them. Because, you know, if you if you constantly say that person's really good at that and they just feel bad about themselves. So I want them to feel proud of their team and their club that they work at or they're, you know, they're part of. And that actually it's great that they're really good at that and they're really proud of them. You know, so for, I mean, I coach nine to 11s at the moment, um, uh, my little group, and I've had them since they were sort of five and five years old. So they've been together for a long time. And so I think in that respect, it does help that they know that certain people are good at that. Um, and then it's just a case of sometimes it's good to sort of say, well, yeah, they're really good at that. But do you know, do you, do you think, uh, why? Do you know why? Yeah, because actually they work really hard at their splits. You know, they're really good at that. But I see them on the on the side and they, they really work hard. And I know at home they're working hard and they've seen that improvement over the time. So I do try and if someone is better than somebody else at something, uh, we try and sort of think about why it is and what they're doing potentially. So it's, you know, what they're doing to make them good at it. Because, at, you know, if they if they put the effort in, then hopefully, you know, that they will be able to have the same success as, they, as the other person does. Thank you. So I, I'm what I'm hearing there is that that you try and focus on that, that balance and what they each have but also that um rewarding the effort they put in and what they do to become skillful rather than they're kind of talented or not talented that yeah. you're encouraging mastery yeah. in what they do um thank you nick if i come to you i um can you can you sort of give us examples of maybe um how that's different within a team sport and the way the sort of social and um and emotion maybe cultural influences um are, are different within a sport like football yeah i think you know generally a you know nine ten year old kid is a nine ten year old kid regardless of sport or regardless from, from a lot of the kind of my experiences of doing some of the research i did they're very similar around the world and in the sense of uh i did a big project when i was in football that was based upon trying to understand what kids uh, liked or didn't like about football and why they played and what was important to them. And we would give them a task where they had 16 different statements and they were in little groups. Um, they had to uh, organize that 16 by selecting their top nine. So they would get rid of the other seven that weren't important to them. And then organize the top nine in order of importance, one to nine in a diamond shape, so a one, two, three, two, one formation. And it was fascinating watching the kids because I learned more watching the kids than I did of anything else before. So it was a mixture of statements and the kids would literally pick up one of the statements that said, it's important to me I win trophies and medals. And they'd go, no, not at all. And chuck it away. It's important to me I win the league. No, not important. And I did this with 200 groups of kids around the country. It was boys, girls, top of the league, bottom of the league, rural, urban, uh, professional game, grassroots game. And then uh, people I know that did this task and repeated it in America, they repeated it in uh, Australia. So it might be kind of westernized cultures maybe that it's very similar. But they all came out with the same findings. That at that age, the kids are driven by intrinsic reasons. They love playing the game. They love making new friends. They love scoring goals. They want to be there with their mates. 
And I can still remember having this conversation with um, a lad called Jack, who who's now at Arsenal and the under 18s at Arsenal. And as an under 10, I said to him, why do you play football, Jack? And he said, just to make new friends. And he just happened to play his football in a Premier League academy with other kids that were quite good like him. But he still had exactly the same motivations because he loves playing the game and because he wants to meet new friends. So that's a really important factor that sometimes I think we get wrong because what we started to do was we didn't think about what the kids' values were. So their view of the world is really important. And what we started to do was just impose the adult values on them. It's all about leagues and trophies and medals and not for kids it isn't. So I think we just, one of the crucial bits I think that we found was um, listen to the kids, hear what they've got to say and all of their different things, whether it's home life or friends, changing schools, all of those kind of things would massively influence them, but impact on our coaching as well. So it was really important that we started to hear them. Yeah, thank you. I, I can see Greg has dropped links in if people haven't read those posts. Um, I, what I really loved about that was the, uh, uh, I know you then did the same thing with some of the adults. You said you threw the adults and the coaches out when you asked the children so they couldn't influence them. And then you asked the, the adults the same question and um, you didn't get the same answer, did you? No, unsurprisingly, the parents thought the kids were interested in trophies and medals and winning the league. Just because it's, you know, we've, we've got a different brain by that stage and it's kind of attuned to work in a different way. But kids were still driven by the intrinsic bits. And the best bit was then showing the parents and the coaches, oh, by the way, this is what your kids have said. And that was the shock value then. But that started to influence um, parent and, te- uh, and parent coach meetings at the start of the year because we shaped the environment around what the kids wanted from the experience, not what the adults thought that the kids wanted. Yeah, great. I, I've um, one of the first answers I had back actually when I asked people to ask their children those um, those three questions, four questions at the beginning, was somebody who is a coach and and coach developer in uh, in adventure sports getting back to me and saying, "Thank you. I've just had the most incredible conversation with my daughter." opened up by asking these questions that for some reason I hadn't thought to have myself and it's really given me some insight into how she feels about going back into her sport which was swimming um, at the moment so um, that really made me smile and I, I did love the the answers that you got back from how they felt about you know losing it's like yeah I've forgotten after I've had a shower or as long as we get cheesy chips on the way back it's all okay <laughs> and uh, so yeah, I think a really strong thing there is is to 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 listen to them, to create the space, isn't there, to 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 allow the children to have those conversations and really listen to what they're saying. So um, some some bits I think just picking up from what you said, Nick, there as well. You said that it was really important to understand the wider um, environment, family, school, social, cultural influences on the children at that age as well. Could you expand a little bit, maybe, with some examples? Well, I just think, you know, it goes back to one of those things that we we talked about and Gemma mentioned about kind of really getting to know the kids and connecting with them. Um, you know, we had uh, the beauty, I think, of probably where the academy was for, for us in southwest London. Um, you had a real mixture of inner city London kids that um, a lot of single parent families living in tower blocks on some real tough estates. But we had kids at the other end of the, the extreme. And I can remember that uh, we came back after Christmas one year and I said to the kids, you know, what, what was your best Christmas present? And I had this, this one kid called, uh, called Abdul, who uh, his brother, uh, one brother had been deported, one brother was in prison, never seen dad. Um, and his best Christmas present was a calendar. But the next kid I asked was a kid called Nikolai and he said his best Christmas present was they went skiing over Christmas and they took the family chef. Now, like, like they're at very different ends of the world here. But what the beauty for me was, was that their world has now collided because they happen to be quite good at a game. And otherwise, they never would have had any appreciation of what life was like. And they became quite good mates on the back of it. But um, those kind of things really, for me, are what um, some of those experiences are worth understanding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Gemma, would you like to add anything to that? So I could, uh, you see, you uh, by your expression, you're resonating with a lot of what Nick said through there. 
Yeah, well, I did say, um, especially for gymnastics, because, you know, some of these kids are sort of, you know, if they're training sort of the elite level, they'll be in the gym four or five times a week, you know, three hours at a time. So it does become their second, their second home. They're like, they're sort of like another family almost. Um, and even if it's just once or twice a week, we we had, a, it is a, it's really nice that I think it's another safe environment for them to be in. Um, we had one girl who was, um, you know, been with us a long time. She just started, she started being really emotional and, and we couldn't really work out why. And um, she's normally really kind of calm and chill, but she was becoming really emotional. Um, and when we spoke to her mum, it was actually that she'd been, um, she'd been being bullied at school. She's having a really tough time of it. And actually the gym um, was the only thing that was keeping her going. It was the one thing that she couldn't wait to get to, that she was so... Um, pleased and happy to be with because it was a really nice safe place for her to be with her other friends who were outside school so it is you know although it's you know it, it's a different sort of people it's a different sort of relationship that they have which is sometimes completely separate from school and it's really nice that they can share with you know with the other other members of their peers um so that's that is key i said the other tricky thing for gymnastics is like between 9 to 11 especially as we come to 11 is we have quite a big drop out then because, as we said, you know, their bodies are changing, they're finding it hard, they need to do more hours. Um, and so at some point, they just sort of say, this, this isn't for me. Actually, it's that sort of what we're trying to make sure is that we're giving them other avenues to stay involved in the sport, whether that be in a different discipline, whether that be through you know, helping and coaching, judging, becoming a young leader. Um, because actually, they've spent so much time in this place, we don't want to lose them. We, you know, we love that they're they've been you know a part of the club for so long but also they don't want to they don't want to leave either so it's really nice that to, we can try and find a way to keep them involved in the sport even if it's not participating at the level that they've been at so far one of the other things that i kind of found from some of these focus groups was they started to understand um uh, they didn't like being embarrassed in front of their mates mm -hmm. because they were a lot more aware of different things and equally, they didn't like being embarrassed by their parents. And one of the big things that came through from the research that we did, uh, and I'm sure, Gemma, this is not you, but boys didn't like being embarrassed by their mums. No. It was one of those big things that came through. Um, and I can remember one kid at this focus group in Worcestershire, he said to me, he said, oh, he said, I was playing last week and my mum was on the side going, come on, come on, come on. He said, I literally stopped during the game and said, mum, I'm not a horse. <laughs> and, and, I, and that was one of the things that came through. And one of the big things that they said to me was, it was like a big spotlight was being put on them as mm. their parents shouted at them from the side of the pitch. Mm. And it was the one thing that they really didn't like. And, and I've experienced it in lots of sports and not just football. And one of my colleagues that works in um, ice skating said some of the ice skating parents, nightmare, like real nightmare. So I'm pleased it's not just football, but again, it's, you know, how do we as coaches influence parents to start to think about, well, what's the role of a parent on the side? Do they say nothing? Do they just clap and applaud? Or do they give feedback? And there might be different things that the kids want from, from those experiences. So again, it's working with, all of the units around the sporting experience to help those kids understand because those social things affect the environment and the emotions of the kids. I think, it's, sorry, oh, so I think the parents is key because actually as well from a parent, they're also investing a lot of time, whether it's mm. they're bringing their kid to the gym three or four times a week and they're paying, you know, they're paying the money, the leotards, the competition fees or all these things. So they, they feel that they are, um, you know, emotionally invested in this sport for their child as well but actually i think that particularly at this age between nine and eleven is the key point that the kids doing it then they're not doing it because their mum makes them come because at that point you can tell in the gym they don't want to they don't want to be here and at home i'm sure they were going i don't want to go mum dad whoever um so i think it's a really key point and it would be really nice that actually parents coaches really support the child to become that really intrinsically motivated person because if if they're doing it for them and we support them for doing it for them then actually they're going that's going to give them much more longevity in the sport mm. i've uh, i i think there's some great great stuff there that's really interesting and two bits i'd like to pick up on and one of them both of you've talked about very much creating a safe space 
within your sports and within your coaching environment so that whatever the um, whatever's happening with the children outside of that, you're creating an environment that's safe for them to be and hopefully supports their needs and their development as as human beings as well as as well as sports. But the other thing that both of you have uh, that's come through is is that um, as much as possible to make sure that you're having those conversations with the parents, with the children, with the coaches or the people you're working with so that you get to know and understand everybody and you have an opportunity to have them part of creating that safe space so that, that everybody's kind of on the same hymn sheet. Um, and I, I, I was... Um, I was listening to um, Marco Sullivan yesterday on the podcast, and one of the first things he said was they talked about really having those conversations and making sure they brought the parents in, but also changing the language they used as well so that they influenced the way the parents used language and the way the parents behaved around the children. So really making it um, wider, you know, thinking about it in a much wider way. So I remember getting it really wrong once, and... I'd said to the kids, we, this was with the under 10s, and we were playing at home. Um, I picked a relatively easy game for the kids, but I, I literally, before the game, I said, right, I said to the players, right, you're organizing everything today. You're deciding the formation, when we do the substitutes, you're deciding how, like you're doing everything. It's over to you. And I knew what would happen is that they would play one in defense and then five up front. Like that would probably go what happened because they all want to score goals. Um, and we would probably be five nil down after three minutes. And, I, and, and we were. But what I hadn't done was got all the parents together and said, look, this is what's going to happen. Like, you're going to see learning unfold in front of you um, when, when this all now starts to unfold and the kids work out, ah, OK, we need some more players at the back to defend. But I hadn't brought the parents along with me on the journey. So they started to get upset and whinge and shout at the kids because we were rapidly shipping goals. So next time I did it, the first thing I did when the kids were sorting themselves out, leading their own warm up, I got all the parents together and said, look, this is what's going to happen. It is going to be messy and a car crash for the first five minutes, but that's OK. And this is why. But I got that really wrong the first time and never brought the parents with me. So it's great to try that kind of stuff, but definitely engage the parents. Yeah, I find that with um, competition. So our design, whatever the focus is when we're going to competition, because although I say, you know, although we're going, we don't, we don't know what these other people are going to be able to do. We, we can only control what we do on the day. So I'll talk to the kids about this is our this is our focus. I just want you to maybe um, I don't know try this. We've, we've not competed this skill before, so it's great. You're going to go out and you're going to compete this bar routine. It's the first time we've done it, and that's great. And I'll try and tell the parents I want them to do this, this, and this. And it's something specific to them, whether it be they're competing a new move. If we're going to try and you know we're going to go clean on beam, we're going to have no falls um, and bring them on. Because if if the focus is on whether they win a medal or whether they're in the top eight, we, I can't I can't control that. I can't control how good the other. 20 people are at the competition we can only control what they do so then I, I i make it clear to the gymnast and i make it clear to the parent as well that this is a target i've set that kid and it'll be different for each of them um so hopefully that that's how they measure the success as opposed to they came seventh and there were seven in the group because if they've done really well for them and the other six kids are better than them there's no there's no harm in that there's no there's nothing wrong with someone being better than you in the day there is wrong with being disappointed you haven't come first because you weren't happy. We just have to go back to the gym and try harder. Mm. Oh, unmute. <laughs> Am I unmuted? Yeah, yeah. you're fine. That's your one for the day. <laughs> Don't. I've used it up all day. I'm not good. <laughs> Um, we've got a couple of questions, actually. I just thought we'll feed a few in and pick back up again, if that's all right. Um, one of them is asking if you've got a visual support of what we're discussing. But not quite, not as Gucci as last week. I'm very sorry, but we do have a little side with some bits on. And um, But the, the second question, I think um, maybe uh, you, the, you could answer that. So they're saying, what, what are the main differences between the 5 to 8 and the 9 to 11? You know, what, what's what's changing in those age groups that maybe we would want to um, to consider? Go for it, Gemma. Uh, so I would say that, like, as I said, the main thing, for, one of the main things for us is I think that they're, 
they're really doing it for themselves that they're, they're not coming to gym now because their parents are bringing them because you know they want them to do a cartwheel or they want them to do these things because by the time they get to nine to eleven they have to want to put in their hard work they have to put in the sort of physical preparation side uh, whether that be through their strength their flexibility their endurance training um, and that's hard work and i think nine to eleven year olds will either be doing it because they really want to do it and they want to get better or they'll be like, this is, I'm not interested, I don't care. Uh, so, whereas the five to eight, the skills they're learning and the things they're doing, you can sort of, you can do some of that in gymnastics without as much physical preparation um, and the flexibility that you need to do it. So, that's key. And I think actually the social aspect, because one, they'll have either a different group of friends, a different, um, or, you know, they're coming because they enjoy spending time with their friends. Whereas at five to eight, they tend, although they like coming with their friends, it's not the it's not the main thing. Whereas between nine to eleven, I think the fact that they have friends at the gym is really key. Yeah, it's um, there's definitely um, uh, I would certainly echo all of that, and that resonates still, I think, in team sports, regardless. Um, uh, and some of the research that we did that, that that doing it for the parents was way down the list of importance. It was m much more about themselves at nine to eleven. Um, the big thing I, I would say is probably focus of attention with five to eight you know you might need 45 different activities planned because you know that you've probably got them for you know, five or seven minutes and, and then unless you've kind of moved it on or taken the, the story into a different place or you kind of captured their attention whereas nine to eleven is typically i've got a better focus of attention and stay on task for a bit longer and if they're engaged and involved in different ways we'll, we'll probably play the same game for half an hour without a problem if it if it's fun and exciting and it's fair and they've all still got a chance of winning mm. um so that for me would be the big one i certainly find with my six-year-old now he he still likes doing things and trying lots of things but as they start to get nine to eleven they'll have a bit more of an idea about what they like and then what they don't like um but for him the friends bit is still relatively important so he goes to rugby but really sure he likes rugby particularly but four of his mates from his class go there so and he's a bit like me as soon as there's going to be like tackling and contact and stuff he'll be like no i don't fancy that much <laughs> so uh, so i can see that happening but definitely the big thing for me is that focus of attention just you know he hasn't got much at the moment but nine to eleven certainly will, will develop much. Yeah, the other nice thing I find with 9 to 11s is that um, you can start to bring them on board with what you're doing. So whereas 5 to 8, we're quite um, explicit with what we want. So we're going to do this, this and this, and I'll, I'll have to tell them everything. With 9 to 11s, it's quite nice in that they, they, they know a bit more about the sport. They know the sort of things that we do. And then I'll bring them in, so I'll give them options. So, for example, on Saturday, we did a circuit, and I was like, okay, well, each of you would do an exercise. So the eight chosen exercise they have to do for 30 seconds and we you know and i can i can sort of if they've all chosen something about their legs i'll say okay well you can you choose to think of an arm exercise now and we'll do it that way but actually we, i get a bit more buy-in from them as well because they feel they're involved in some of the decision making processes about what they're doing and why they're doing it um which is really nice obviously post 11 it's much more about a discussion because you know at that point they do know so much about the sport and they know, you know, what they can and can't do and their strengths and weaknesses a bit more. But it's a really nice age where you really start to build some sort of, um, you know, get some buy-in from them about how they develop and how they focus their training. So, you know, it's not our say, we'll do this and this, which one do you want to do first? And, you know, it's nice, I think, that they feel that they have some ownership about what they're doing as well. Our goal was always within four weeks of when we took a new group at under 10s, our goal was within four weeks to have them leading their own warm-up. Mm. So we talk about the structure, what it flows and looks like, and where they need to be by the end of it before that whistle goes for kickoff. That within a month, right, they're taking their own warm-up, and we're starting to give them responsibility for this straight away. Mm. And that went across everything that we did. So I used to say at the start of the year, look, if I see you walking from the car park to, uh, to the pitch and mum or dad is carrying your bag, then mum and dad is in trouble because uh, <laughs> they took responsibility for packing their bag. And yeah. if they forgot the shin pads, they forgot the shin pads and then they learned that that was part of it. But they took responsibility. They carried their own stuff. They carried their own bag. They packed their own bag because it's all starting to move towards autonomy. And I see Greg mm -hmm. mentioned something in the chat box. 
It's exactly it. You know, we would start to give them that and start to give them little roles of leadership throughout it, whether it was leading the team talk or, uh, or packing their own bag, which is just nudging them towards it. Okay. There's that real transition there, isn't there, in that, that age range, I think. And, and I know something that um, we haven't sort of explicitly talked about, but there's so much, um, there's, there's so much diversity in that age range maturationally, isn't there? So um, I think that, that makes it probably even more important, I would imagine, to be really flexible in the needs of those individual children and, and what they need from you and how much so that you can cater for such a wide variety of um, ability and maturation within those age groups. Um, I'm just going to pick up a question from um, the chat box. And that's, this is from Danielle, who um, works within the FA. And she's saying, uh, she's actually asking about um, whether or not the research that you did that, that has gone into looking at motivation and play is still relevant, or whether you think some of that um, attention has become more in extrinsic towards things like getting followers or recognition through, through social media. Um, is, that re is that relevant at this age, or is it still just <laughs> not quite there? <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, my son says, oh, Daddy, can we film a YouTube video? So I'll sit there and record the telly as he's playing Minecraft. And he'll say, we're looking for 5,000 likes. He doesn't know what 5,000 likes mean, but he says it because he's seen it on other YouTube videos. Um, I think in, in terms of people having their own social media, it's probably still a little bit early in that 9 to 11 age group. I think as soon as they hit secondary school and there's a lot more... Um, shift to extrinsic and finding your own place in different groups and in the hierarchy. Uh, it will be interesting to repeat the research and, and see what would happen with it. My guess is that 9 to 11's primary school age group will still have that intrinsic drive um, where sport is concerned, but they might start to have a bit more of an awareness of it. Um, and certainly as you go into the teenage years, I think that will probably influence a lot more things. But um, it would be really interesting to see. My gut would be wouldn't change much because they're a little bit too young, particularly. Uh, what, what was your experience, Gemma? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say although maybe they're they're aware of like the TikTok and Instagram and things, probably from looking at their parents' phones. Not a lot of them have their own accounts or their own sort of you know maybe towards the eleven year old they're just getting into it. Um, but I just think it's I think it's just Drilling, we, you know, we, or I certainly, you know, really try and drill them from the time they're coming in. That it's about them themselves and about their own intrinsic motivation, and you know, um, and judging them on their own improvements, not compared to somebody else. Which I know they do. They do obviously compare themselves to somebody else in the group or what somebody else can do. But then I always try and bring it back to them and actually the improvements they've made um, and how much they've improved in something else. And if they want to be able to do that. But what do we need to do to, to get that? If they want to be able to do that skill or to do, I don't know, that combination of something, okay, well then let's have a look at what you need to do to have the skills to be able to do it. So I think it's just having that conversation with them for them to, to realise because, you know, although they do look at those sort of things, I think it's just trying to tie it back into what we can at the gym. I remember one parent that I, uh, I remember having a conversation, we played away at Luton and his son, he was a Spanish dad, Spanish son but was born in England um, probably the most talented kid at under 10 I'd seen an incredible play he's at Everton now he's been in the England youth system um, and he scored eight goals in like 20 minutes or something ridiculous when we played at Luton and I remember saying to his dad uh, you know if, if we don't get him through to the first team here you know we failed which in hindsight is a ludicrous statement but his dad actually just said no if you don't develop him to be a good person, then you've failed. Mm. And, and you know what? That's the kind of parent that we want that focused yeah. on the outcomes for Raph as a kid that was way more important than him getting through to be a, a footballer. Yeah. I think that's key when we when we still get competitions and things as well. Like there's nothing there's nothing that I want to see the kids do more than cheering each other on, whether that just be from our club or another club or saying well done to somebody who's in the group who's gone clean because actually it's just one competition at one event. It's a small mm. thing actually recognising that somebody else has 
achieved something or done really well and being pleased with them is, is something that's going to stand them in such good stead, you know, moving forward in their lives. Mm. Being a nice person. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great to have parents like that, especially of somebody who is so skillful as well at that age. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, phenomenal for that for that lad, um, and, and really good to hear. I, a, a couple of things, just picking up on some of the themes there, um, I, I, and I probably it's probably something to pick up next week, actually, Gemma, when we talk about teenagers. But um, a, a, a sort of a part of me just thinks there's possibly with girls and doing things like showing their splits on Instagram or doing stuff like that. That that's a whole different ball game from like you know, play, well excuse the pun, messing around with with a ball on a pitch with your mates. They're, they're just, yeah, So I, this, but I think that's probably something we pick up next week when we talk about teenagers. But uh, like you say, not quite rid its ugly head at this age, thank goodness. Thank yeah, you. Not, yeah, that's a 14-year-old daughter, and actually that's exactly where she is. She follows a lot of dancers on Instagram and things, and she sees all these things and then, like you know, during lockdown, that's what she spent most of her time doing is trying to get into these ridiculous um, flexibility poses to make lovely pictures and things, which is which is nice. But actually, she's obviously she, you know, being older is so much more most, like um, influenced, I should say, by what she sees on social media. Yeah, mm. and potentially there's a dark side of that too as well, isn't there? Yeah. If you're not pretty enough, or you're not slim enough, or you're not flexible enough to make them. Yeah. Pictures. I, I'm all of them now. Not slim enough. Not flexible enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. I, I can see that Anne Marie's just popped something in there, and uh, and actually, uh, Anne Marie Anne Marie's uh, podcast with me should be being released this week. And one of the key things uh, she spoke about at the beginning actually was that how when she was in the Olympics, um, and I can't remember what the date is, so I'm not going to guess in case I offend her. <laughs> But she said all they had was like a phone in the hall and, you know, nobody cared about what you look like. And, you know, the Russians had cool tracksuits and that was kind of it, really, you know, in terms of image and, and you know, worrying about stuff like that. So it is a different it is a different space, isn't it? And I guess that that makes it really important for us to really talk to the, our children and to listen to them. And mm -hmm. also as they get older and start, um, you know, when they get to the age, um, maybe less so with gymnastics, where it's a shorter you know, they're, they're already in that age where they're competing, aren't they? But with football, we don't really know what it's going to look like in years to come when perhaps they will be, you know, professionally or when they'll be playing for fun and hopefully still enjoying the game forever. Yeah, and it's a bit like so Jim and I said last week that, you know, what, what got you a medal last Olympics probably won't get you a medal in the next Olympics. And, and it's a little bit the same from a, from a football perspective, really, that, you know, the... The ten-year-old kid today that that might make some kind of senior debut at nineteen, twenty, ten years time. I've no idea what the game's going to look like. So, you know, one of the one of the key things that we should be focusing on is their ability to learn and adaptability. So that regardless of what a manager or a coach throws at them along the pathway, they have the ability to be resilient and deal with some of those challenges as they appear. That's one of those crucial things, I think that that we don't do well enough. And sometimes we get caught up worrying about the technical tactical, when actually some of those key skills that will help them apply the technical tactical are probably as, if not more important. And this is for all kids, regardless of whether you're in the talent pathway. I think this is just a, you know, a general life skill that we should be thinking about for all kids. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, I think if people, some parents as well, they underestimate all the other things, the other skills these kids are uh, developing. From being in the gym and being in this, you know, say the resilience, the coping methods, um, you know, just the the hard work that they know that you have to put in to achieve something that you really want. Whereas I had a parent, I had a parent the other day saying, "Oh, you know, well, my daughter's been doing it so long, but I'm not sure she's going to make it now." And you know, she's still really good. She's still a you know, really good gymnast uh, for her age, but actually, they were almost writing her off. But actually, she was enjoying it. She'd made great friends. She, um, you know, she was still a really good gymnast. She was doing stuff that the majority of children would never do. But the fact that they thought that she, they weren't making it, um, you know, and, and I think actually that's a real shame. You, you know, you've got to see what the, what your child has developed just outside of just maybe not being, you know, the top three in their age group or something. 
that. Yeah. Sorry, Nick. Did you want to? Do you want no, to? I think that, that's some of the education with parents. You know, I, we have one kid in who was on trial for. I think he came in from Charlton on trial, and I was still on the side chatting to his dad because again, I just wanted to understand more about home life and kids and stuff like that. And he just went to me, "Well, are you having him?" And I'm like, oh, "He's not a new TV. Like, like what do you mean? <laughs> am I having him?" Like, you know, it, it was literally within an hour of meeting the lad. Um, and some parents' expectations, again, it's part of the process that we have to con constantly educate. Effectively. So I have a question for both of you then around that and this longer term participation. Um, do you think that the clubs and the NGBs are, are getting better at making it easy for children to stay in those sports if they're not likely to be in the talent pathway? So. I'm just, you know, sort of, you know, you've talked about Gemma that, you know, they drop out, um, or you put them somewhere else, you know, or you sort of signpost them somewhere else. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think that there are changes happening that makes it easier for them to stay engaged, even if they're not going to be elite? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we're doing obviously for gymnastics as well. You know, you have sort of some of the, you know, the disciplines like, for for example, artistic, where you have to be really good on four pieces for women's or six pieces for men. Um, and that's really demanding, but actually we have so many other disciplines around those. We have tumbling, DMT, we have, you know, acro, we have team gym, we have loads of other, um, we have loads of other disciplines, which would be great for these children for, you know, to offer more to them. So if that isn't their thing, if they decide that they don't want to put in the hours, their parents can't put in the hours because they've got other, you know, you know, other, other, you know, things on their restrictions on their time, that there is another avenue for them to go to and it doesn't mean giving up. Um, that could mean going into coaching, some sort of leadership. And uh, uh, British Gymnastics are really good. They have a young leaders program. They have a sort of coaching program, which we you can do from uh, 14 at the moment. Um, so I think that's really key that actually once someone has, you know, spent so much of their time in the sport, that we do try and, and keep them. I think the sad thing is and the hard thing is that sometimes that's not always possible at every club because one club might be in a leisure centre and they don't have the facilities, the time or the staff to be able to, you know, give them to give that to them. So, or it's a, it's just a, it's a much, um, you know, smaller opportunities for them. But actually some of the big clubs, they, they do. Uh, but it's, it's like I say, it's, that, it's clubs signposting them to say, well, you, you know, you could go and try tumbling and that's at this club and supporting them, you know, to be able to do that if, if that's what they wish to do. Football's very hit and miss. Um, football depends on if you've got good people in that talent pathway. So there are, there'll be some good people in some good clubs that will, um, so a kid may leave a talent system at 10, 11 is the age group we're talking about. Um, and they may well have good links with a local club that they will signpost this kid to to say, go and continue playing here. We'll keep following you. We'll keep an eye on your development. Good clubs will do that. Unfortunately, there's some um, not so good people into not so good clubs that mainly couldn't really give a monkey's. It's a numbers game for them. They'll get as many as they can. They'll get rid of as many as they can. And the ones that they do release, they, they have no duty of care for. Um, they're the ones that, um, that are, uh, it's not good enough. It's just not good enough from an adult perspective. You can do better than that and look after the kids a bit more. So the good clubs do it good and really well. Some of the bad ones um, need shaking. Thank you, there. Thank you, Nick. I um I think uh, Anne Marie has got a question that leads on from that actually. She's talking about Norway not permitting national competition until they're fourteen. I know the work um, AIK Stockholm are doing. They're they're not kicking them out early. And one of the stats that I'd heard from there was that when they did look at the kids that were in the talent pathway, they found that I think it was something like five percent were born in the last three months of their year of their cutoff. Um, and and I I think you know I was quite shocked actually to to hear that um, you know and the impact that that would have on the way maybe children are expected to move through a talent pathway or or out mm -hmm. like clubs perhaps do if they don't make those particular timeframes in a in a in a, in a time when they are so different maturationally. Yeah, we still have an issue that relative age affects. Um, you know, the early born in the year dominate sporting systems in this country. But, you know, again, then that starts to impact on all the things that we've talked about, along with those kind of factors about how we coach. Um, 
you know, so I spent a lot of time looking at how I would group kids. So, you know, I would group kids purposely from different backgrounds so that they would spend time discussing problems. Um, we had one age group uh, during one year that had a particularly kind of racial issue. And so what I would do is I would put kids from different backgrounds together in group of four and go, right, like, here's the tactical problem I want you to solve. But I wasn't bothered about the football outcome. I was more interested in, right, who dominated the conversation, who brought others into the conversation, who could solve conflict within those discussions to work out a strategy, all of those kind of life skill pieces. I was set up within the practices that we designed as well. So again, it was really important that we used our practical ways of setting up coaching to start to to manage and develop some of those outcomes that we talked about earlier, some of those social and emotional development pieces. Yeah, I think um, also the, the um, not permitting any competition to their 14 is interesting because that's obviously that, that's late for um, for gymnastics to a certain extent. But also it, it depends on where you're coming from. If you're in a big club and you, um, especially at the elite level, um, and you've got a, a you know a, a sort of bigger pool of people to compare and challenge yourself to, um, but you know some clubs may have one gymnast in that age group, and so actually you're a um, was it a big fish, a little fish in a big pond because a big fish in a little pond that's the one. So actually you've got nothing to compare yourself. You're you're always mm -hmm. going to be the best in that club. There's no one to drive you to get to the next thing to face your challenges. Whereas competition or at least regional uh, events can do that. Um, but actually, sometimes the, the regions around the, around the country can be really diverse. So you can have some really strong regions. And actually, then they have, uh, you know, those kids are getting a much better almost opportunity than ones who are maybe who do not have the same level of competition um, because they haven't got those things to strive towards. So it's interesting. Mm. I, I'm I'm aware that we're we're rapidly running short of time, so it would be really nice, I think, at this point to um, to to really highlight maybe what you think the key things are. So if you were to just do a, a summary of your sort of top tips and the stuff that you think um, is most useful to focus on for this age group, what would they be? And we'll we'll pop up some of the um, the kids' answers <laughs> to their questions in a minute. <laughs> So I guess, do we go first? Go for it. I say, um, one, start bringing them on the journey with you. So when you're coaching them, start having those discussions. Start making sure they are they have buy-in to what you're doing and why you're doing it. So rather than just saying we're going to do this conditioning, start explaining to them why they need it, what it's going to give them when they when they can do it, um, and and let them have some sort of decision making within elements of of the session. Um, so that when you're um, informing them and you're making them more, um, you know, aware of what they're doing and why it's going to make them better gymnasts, better coaches, if they can stay in the sport that way, so they have a greater awareness. Um, and, you know, obviously, no, you have to know your participants. By this point, you have to know what motivates them, how you're going to keep them interested and how you can adapt what you're doing. So I like to have lots of adaptations that that they, to make sure that every time they come in the gym, as much as possible, they've achieved something, whether that be it doing an extra rep or something, they've changed some sort of skill a, li a little way, um, and particularly with like the recreational side. So these kids are coming maybe an hour a week, um, and, and it's going to take them a long time to learn a new skill, but actually by maybe changing how they do it, maybe linking it to a different skill, changing the, their finishing position, doing it with a partner, all these sorts of things. They're achieving a learning something new, they're doing something different, but something that maybe not necessarily is going to take them a long time to really accomplish so that they have these little mini wins all the time. I think that's really, uh, really key. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And it saves me saying some of mine because they're absolutely identical. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's almost as if we planned it. Yeah. Um, uh, so I've just put mine in the chat box there. That's my top tips. Um, I can remember a session I did with the kids uh, and we spent 90 minutes doing some stuff on counter-attacking. I tried some new games. The kids, they were all over it. They went really well. I was really pleased. I got the kids together at the end to say, right, tell us all the stuff that you learned about counter-attacking. And I expected them to talk about when and where to find space and what speed and tempo to attack, all of those kind of things. And one kid, Steve Sessignon, who's still there now as a pro, 
He said to me, I learned to defend when outnumbered. So I spent 90 minutes doing a session and he'd taken the entire opposite of what I wanted him to take from the session. So that, that for me, I learned a lot around point three on there, ask and invite questions. So what they take from the practice might not be what you think you want them to get from the practice because they will have their own mind about the kind of things that they want to do, want to get better at. So the more you engage and bring them with us on this journey, I think it's really, really important. Um, and as much as anything, try and minimize that, that pressure on them. So they'll feel their own pressure. So whenever we played Chelsea, they knew that there was pressure, not from us as the coaches, but because they were playing Chelsea and because of their parents. Um, we did one team talk one morning, all about when we played Chelsea away, all about the London Marathon, because it was the marathon that day. And all we talked about was, how would it feel if you finished the London Marathon? What do you think your parents would feel? And all they, all they talked about was feeling proud. Mm -hmm. And that was the message that they went on and played with. Um, not about score, not about tactics, nothing to do with that. Just go out there, try your hardest, and try and make your mum and dad proud. And that's the focus, really. Don't get caught up on the score. Just just focus on the performance and how they go about trying to achieve that bit. So uh, I would definitely agree with Gemma's there. And as I said, my five will probably echo pretty much what she just said there as well. Yeah, your, uh, your five aren't in my chat box, Nick. So I'm not uh, oh. maybe pop them back in again for us. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, thank you. I'm going to, um, if, I'm not sure we could have a slide up of just some of the things that the children said, because I, I think that really echoes um, what you both just uh, both just covered there. And um, maybe the few minutes we've got left, we could uh, maybe just think about anything that is useful to be mindful of. We've already talked about really making sure we listen to the kids, we talk to them, we get to know them. Um, so these are just some of the answers that I had back from the asking the children what they thought was important to them. And one of the things that I really that really came through was they talked about how they felt, you know, feeling free when they were running, swimming, making them feel relaxed. They were actually talking about how they felt physically and how, you know, what the sport meant to them and their friends and things. So um, you can just think that our last few minutes, it might be nice just to have a little reflection on, um, is there just anything that, uh, to be particularly mindful of, of this age group going back into their sporting environment? Um, uh, I already had a comment saying the COVID rules are making it hard and they've been split up from their friends and the coach wanted them to catch up with what they'd missed during lockdown, um, which was a bit of a, oh, so uh, yeah, I leave you both to answer that to finish off. Reconnect first for me, simple. Don't worry about the, the sport bit. Just reconnect with the kids. Let the kids reconnect with each other. Let the kids reconnect with you. Focus on the social don't worry about catching up with anything because um, who are you catching up with? Because everyone's been in the same situation. So it's not like you're suddenly miles behind. Just focus on reconnecting and getting to know them and ask them about their experiences. What have they been like during lockdown? Have they found it particularly difficult? Have they been struggling with anxiety or lack of physical activity or uh, what their experiences have been like compared to other kids and get them to share with each other. Just focus on reconnecting with the kids. That would be my priority, I think. Yeah, I agree. Definitely, definitely like reconnecting. And I think um, like for for me, for coaching as well, it's going to be a massive shock and a massive change to us and how we coach as well. Because a lot of how we coach is hands on, not necessarily through supporting, but shaping, um, even like giving high fives, you know, this praise element that constantly, get yeah, well done, we're really proud of you, that's a great job. That's going to all change. So it's going to be a massive learning curve on both sides. Um, and I think so. It's gonna it's gonna be patience. I think patience is one skill that we're that everyone's gonna have to have. They're gonna have to be patient with themselves, giving them time to, um, you know, relearn some of these things. They they probably never not done gym for this long, even if it's just you know cartons in the garden. They're now gonna have to go back to doing it in a gym setting, in a different environment. So um, yeah, definitely, I would think the biggest thing is patience with them, with yourselves. Um, so that actually, you know, gradually you'll you'll get back. It, it'll be a new way of of doing it, 
but I don't think that's necessarily going to be a bad thing. It's just, um, you know, taking time. And, and, and if they want to come back after four or five months off, that's fantastic because actually they've now had five months to potentially find something that they like more, whether that or they've fallen out of love with it. So actually it's great that these kids are going to be coming back and wanting to, wanting to carry on with the sport. I think that's brilliant. Thank you both so much. Um, that's us out of time, I'm afraid. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Gemma. We will continue with this theme um, on the uh, Connected Coaches. There's a thread that I've started there. And, uh, uh, and hopefully we can drop some, you can ask questions there if you've still got questions of the panel or of us, and we can, we can answer to our best in those. Uh, so next, the next one is Coaching Teenagers. Uh, that will be next next week and I believe that after that it will be coaching adults so we're sort of moving up the age group slowly uh, hopefully they'll get somebody my age eventually <laughs> 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 then they'll be in trouble <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us um, next week it's going to be on a Tuesday so it's a bank holiday must remember to tell you that and if you want to get your certificate just follow the instructions on the slide thank you very much and we'll see you next week Thanks for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure, Gemma. <laughs> Gemma, you can stay on for five minutes if that's okay. Yep. We always